Good afternoon. My name is Mark Langner. Welcome to Revelation chapter one. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get our PowerPoint going. So I'll share my screen with you and we'll uh, we'll start off by doing that. And uh, just again, so, so happy that you're with me today. I think you're going to uh, enjoy this uh, as we move into Revelation chapter one. And there we go. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, we're going to go from verse four through 20 today. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, the first three verses. And I told you then that, uh, that we would talk about what does it mean that this revelation must soon take place? Well, what that means is that the, that the Bible writers in the New Testament wrote with a sense of imminence. That means that they expected Jesus to come back at literally any moment. And that's how we're supposed to live too. And so we have that in the back of our minds as we kind of start this study today. And I like to always start with uh, a little iambic pentameter or a rhyme, uh, Revelation chapter one, a picture of the eternal son. Um, I had a mentor who uh, taught Revelation over the years and he uses one of these for every chapter. We may do that as well. Uh, but this helps you remember from chapter to chapter which, what each one is about. As we, uh, as we move into today's uh, time together, uh, understand that John was on the island of Patmos. I'm going to set the stage here for you. You'll remember, of course, that John was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, that he walked with Jesus for three years, that he left his family business to join our Lord. Uh, he was in the inner circle with Peter and James, and of course, he was at the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, and he was also with Jesus at the Last Supper, so close to him that the Bible says he leaned up against him. And then we also understand that John was the only apostle with Jesus at the cross, and from the cross, Jesus looked to Mary, and he said to take care of of this woman to take care of Mary. So John, so John was given a huge responsibility far before uh, he received this revelation of Jesus Christ. When he was on the island, he was there because of a emperor named Domitian. And we know that Domitian persecuted Christians. If someone refused to recant their Christianity, then Domitian would have them killed uh, from time to time. And uh, we know that uh, that John was in exile because of, because of his witness uh, for Christ. And during this time, Domitian, like most Romans, was polytheistic. He worshiped multiple gods. Uh, he worshiped Jupiter, which was the equivalent of, of the Greek Zeus. So, uh, and there was a saying at the time, Zeus is, Zeus was, Zeus will be. So, um, so this whole concept of, of, of Zeus and Jupiter um, and their supposed eternal nature was an imitation of who God really is. And we'll see this in the verses in just a few minutes. As usual, Satan is the great imitator. He's always wanting to do what God does and or to be what God is. And of course, he can't be. And so even in these worship of false gods, you see these common themes of things that are scriptural that are taken out of context. And you'll remember that uh, Satan himself quoted the Bible uh, or misquoted the Bible out of context to Jesus during that, that great time of temptation for our Lord in the desert. Uh, we'll also find that uh, Revelation is one of those unusual books with all of its imagery and symbolism, and that has attracted some interesting characters over the years. Uh, one, of course, was David Koresh back in the, in the 90s. Uh, in 93, I believe, when the Branch Davidians uh, compound burned to the ground and, and David uh, Koresh was a false messiah. He had the spirit of the Antichrist that John talks about. And, uh, and he led his people down uh, a, a false road to salvation. And he said that he was the messiah and, and that, um, and that he, he called himself the sinful messiah. So it's a a really evil, uh, dark, manipulative mindset that David Koresh had, and many people, including women and children, died at, died at his hands 
uh, during that standoff with the ATF and the, and the FBI back in the 90s. So we understand from all of that that the revelation is very important. The enemy of God does not want us to understand the truth of the revelation, the hope that is there. Um, even in the first three, three verses we spoke of last week, uh, we saw the first of seven Beatitudes. Blessed is he who reads this word and keeps it. Um, so those who do so uh, are blessed, and, and we see this theme over and over and over again in Revelation seven times. Uh, that there's this hope, there's this beatitude, uh, and and that's an amazing thought concept when you're talking about something that's supposed to be talking about the apocalypse. Well, there's also prophecy. Uh, prophecy is also mentioned at least seven different times in the Revelation, and so we find that these prophetic renderings don't just bring in thoughts of apocalypse or something terrible that's about to take place, although it will take place and it does bring in that, but also a prophecy of hope and grace and peace. And we'll see that as, as we get started today. If you have your Bible app, turn with me to uh, the first chapter of Revelation. And it says this, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. You could preach an entire series on just that sentence. And it says this, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so right at the beginning of this amazing message, we get to see this, uh, this hope, this eternal image of the Godhead. This is uh, something that, that captures the message of the Trinity, the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All are involved in this particular message of hope and love. Uh, some have, uh, Keener described it as this message of love to people, and you'll see these two words, grace and peace, so you'll have a Greek and a Jewish com uh, components here that, uh, that are speaking grace and peace from the Godhead, from the eternal God himself, this inviting message of love and of mercy, of grace, and of peace, and so even at the beginning of the revelation, we get to see that God's plan in, in his entirety, is his entire being, Father, Son, and Spirit, is for all people to come to repentance and love and mercy before him. And a, what an amazing message that is. And then uh, right here, uh, we get to see this thing about seven spirits, and that's confusing to, to some people. Uh, some people think that this is referring to the seven angels that Jesus mentions later, uh, or to some, uh, or to the seven archangels of Jewish heritage and that sort of thing. I don't believe that at all. I believe it's referring to the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit that we see in Isaiah 11 too. And you see these here, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So all of these attributes are part of who the Holy Spirit is here. One of the, um, one of the mistakes that many people make when they're looking at Revelation is that they don't understand that the Holy Spirit is in incredibly involved here. Um, these, this idea that during um, the last days that the Holy Spirit will not be involved, it's just a, it's just a false narrative. God the Spirit will be incredibly involved during the last days, even up through the, the tribulation period. Um, he will be the ones that still draws people to the Lord, that still draws people to Christ. Uh, this indicates, of course, an acting, active, working, spirit-filled presence 
in the revelation. And that's important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and working, even during some of the darkest days that the earth has, has yet to see. Um, and then we also get these, these little trifecta um, descriptions here, these little triplicates. Uh, Henson says, uh, first we see this description of Jesus as the faithful witness. And I've given you some scriptures here. We're not going to read through all of these, but uh, you'll have these in your notes. Uh, but this faithful witness of Jesus Christ, you'll remember that Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees who doubted him that he is a witness of the Father, and he witnesses of the Father, and the Father witness of, witnessed of him. And we see that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. So these two attributes of Christ. And of course, the firstborn of the dead means the resurrected son of the living God who resurrects in turn the rest of us spiritually so that we're living with him for eternity and, and for always. Um, and we'll see here that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's not something that's going to take place in some time in the future. That's something that's still today. He allows these kings and these people to do what they do on the face of the earth right now, but we can rest assured that he is the king of kings and lord of lords in heaven today, that this is not something we're waiting on. He's already, he's already the high priest. He is already the king of kings and the lord of lords. He allows all these other things to take place, and the Bible says he does so uh, out of his grace, because he's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And so the Lord is patient in his coming and establishing his kingdom, but he is right now the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then the Bible also says there are three things that Jesus did for us and does for us. First, that he loved us. And then secondly, that he freed us. Here, The, the Greek here uh, it has this connotation of unchaining us or washing away a, a stain. The Bible says that by the Lord's blood that he washes away our sins. And then not only that, he made us kingdom priests. And so you have uh, these different references. First Peter talks about us being the priest of God. Now, in the Old Testament and in Jewish culture, those priests were, of course, ministering of the law. In the New Testament, when we are made kings and priests, we are made so in the image of Christ. We are under the blood, so we are, we are establishing a spiritual priesthood, the Bible says. And, uh, and Hebrews says this, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So here's this Hebrews message that again tells us that we are washed, we are sanctified, we are moving forward as priests of Jesus Christ himself. As we move uh, on to verse 7, it says this, and this is, um, this is one of the worship hymns of one of a number of worship hymns that you'll find in Revelation. It says this, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. And then notice verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end of the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So here's this term Almighty, again used about seven times in the Revelation. And the Almighty is this, the, this, this, um, this concept of the ancient of days, the almighty God. And he's reiterating again, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the eternal one. So, so Domitian and all of his followers can follow this false set of gods if they want to, but God himself is saying, I am the eternal one. I am the one who is here. And if you look back to verse seven, these are references uh, that John is making back to previous scriptures. And one uh, was, was this in the, in the book of Daniel. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached with the ancient of days and was escorted before him. 
and then in Zechariah, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. And then John himself in his gospel says this, also another scripture says, referencing Zechariah, they will look at the one that they pierce. And so uh, there's this understanding in the revelation that there's this apex, this culmination of Israel and the people of Israel and the and and though Israel was responsible for the, the, the death of Jesus Christ as a, as a nation, we're all responsible for that. And so the Bible says that there will be great mourning because of what has happened, what has taken place, and that we will look on the one that has been pierced. Now, if we are saved, including those who will be saved of Israel, those who are saved, they're looking at the one that has been pierced, but they're looking at, at this one in a mourning of what's happened, but in a grateful, thankful, amazing response to the one who has saved us. And then it says this in verse nine, I, John, so here, here's John again saying, this is me talking, your brother and partner in the affliction. So he is, he is, um, he's equating the suffering that other Christians are going to with himself because he himself is suffering here. So understand that. So I, John, your brother and partner in affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so we see here that John is in this state of worship on the Lord's day. We believe that this was a Sunday because that was the practice of the early Christian church that instead of it being on the, on the Saturday as before during Jewish times or during the law, uh, that now during the time of Christ, that it, was, it took place on the day that he was resurrected. And you'll see that he was worship, worshiping him in spirit and truth as he, he himself was inspired to say by the Holy Spirit. And it shows that there's this, there's this active sense of being in the spirit. That, that he didn't just show up on the Sabbath to do what, uh, just to do the normal thing. The Bible says that he was in the spirit. He was engaged with the spirit. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit is inside you. The Holy Spirit is with you. But there is still an expectation that within the church, when we arrive at the church on Sundays, the Lord himself has a spiritual expectation that we are looking to see what the Holy Spirit's going to do that day. We are listening with a listening ear, as Jesus said over and over and over again, that we, are, we have an understanding that the Holy Spirit will be there and that we are to engage him. This does not mean a passive worship. It means an active, ongoing worship every time we walk in the doors. That's how we're all supposed to come in. And John was obviously doing that. This is reminiscent of Peter, when Peter was in the trance praying at the noonday, and, and then uh, he was taken into the spiritual trance or the spiritual vision and, uh, and was told uh, to eat things that had previously been unclean to him. And the Lord says, don't call things uh, that I have cleaned unclean. And then he was, of course, sent on to Cornelius. And uh, this was to prepare him to go into a Gentile's house. And to, uh, and to see the fall and the presence of the Holy Spirit there. So when we read this in the Revelation, we have to have an understanding that the Spirit of God was with John, and John was there. He was ready to be spoken to, and who showed up? But Jesus himself showed up and gave him this message of hope to all of us. You'll see here that 
that over and over Jesus reiterates who these churches are. And, and uh, again, um, you have Ephesus and Smyrna and Thyatira and Pergamon and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I wanted you to see these on a map because we need to understand that though this message is for the eternal ecumenical church, the whole church, that's you and me too, it was first and foremost given to these active current churches of that day. And so and so uh, these were not all of the churches, but these were churches on main thoroughfares that people would know. Of course, we have the letter to the Ephesians, which I would, uh, I would surmise that most of these churches had probably read uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And, uh, and the letters were passed back and forth between these different churches. And, and we also understand that the Ephesians were given instructions to stand firm, and we'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes, but all of these churches are important to Christ. And then uh, the Bible says this, then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands, man, that's key right there, because that's talking about Jesus is part of the church. He is the foundation of the church. So, so note that as we go forward. And among the lampstand was one like a son of man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. What an amazing picture that we have of Jesus Christ here. And we have all of these different symbolisms uh, and you, you can trace these symbols throughout scripture, um, but I'll, I'll keep this short for you today. There's this robe with the golden sash. Uh, it's a picture of the Old Testament high priest. It, is, it, it conveys complete and absolute authority, both the color and the, and the golden sash itself. And so we see here that Jesus is the high priest. He's standing among the churches. It says that his hair was as white as wool. And this represents in scripture wisdom and righteousness. You know, in today's times, um, people try to cover up their white hair if they, ha I don't have any, but if, if for those who have hair, a lot of, a lot of times as people get older, they try to cover that up. And so you'll see some 85 year old with, you know, like blonde hair or dark hair or whatever. And I've always thought that was kind of amusing, but, but in scripture, white hair was a symbol of honor and of respect. And so, uh, so here we see this of Jesus, that his hair is white as wool. It symbolizes his eternalness as the, as the ancient of days. And then we also see his eyes like a fiery flame. One said, uh, one scholar said that it's an indignant look a fiery flame because he's got this clear view of the churches and he's looking at the churches and unlike us when we look at a church and judge a church based on how the music is or how the preacher preaches or how this or that or whatever Jesus looked at the churches and he could say you're doing this well and you need to improve here this is great oh wait this church you're just dead and so Jesus had a, the right and has the right to judge the churches as they are. And so there's this, um, there's this clear look of fiery, fiery flame, a, a, a holy, righteous look. And then we see that his feet are as bronze. There, this stands for judgment. And brass often did, it spoke for authority and judgment in scripture. And so these feet as bronze. you'll remember that the Ephesian church had been told, hey, when you've done everything else, stand. And here's Jesus standing in ultimate authority and ultimate judgment. You'll also remember that Daniel was told, hey, Daniel, stand. 
So he was given help to stand, but he was told, stand. And this is what Jesus is saying to the churches. And then it's a voice as a cascade of waters. It conveys absolute authority. We'll know that John was probably hearing the, the waves crash against the, the rocks. And so this, this idea of this mighty voice uh, was there and it conveyed absolute authority. And then the double-edged sword, and of course, this is a recurring theme uh, throughout the New Testament, this powerful truth, it's soul rendering. Uh, the, the, it, it rips us apart, it exposes what is good, and it rejects what is evil, and it tells us that we are to live holy lives, this, this word of God that we have. And then, and then lastly here, his face was shining as the sun, this brilliance, this holiness, this majesty. The, notice here, too, that he's got these lampstands and these stars um, all about him. And you'll remember in Scripture that says that we, are to be, that we are to be lights in this world, that we are to let our light stand. It is to be seen. We're not to hide it under a bushel. You'll remember that even from the kids' song, um, that we're not to hide it. No, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to let our light shine before, uh, before the world. And here's Jesus shining as the sun holy, amazing, brilliant. And that's who John saw. And let's look at his reaction. And I like his reaction. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Now that is a emphatic statement. I fell at his feet like a dead man. We'll talk about that in just a second. And it says this, he laid his right hand on me, that right hand of judgment, that right hand of comfort. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. Here's that term again, what takes place after this. Some people consider uh, 119 to be the key verse of the entire revelation. I think it is certainly one of the key verses. And it says this in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, isn't this awesome? Jesus himself is interpreting his own words here. And he's saying all these other things, here's the symbolism. You guys, you know, research your scripture, understand who I am. But here, I don't want you to miss this. The mystery of the seven stars, um, uh, they're the angels of the churches. Now, there are different beliefs about this. Some people believe that these are actual guardian angels of the churches. You know, the, the, the Lord said that there were angels of children. And so um, Pastor John's been talking about this a lot lately. But here, this is saying the angels of the seven churches. Some people believe these are pastors, uh, um, although pastors are rarely called angels anymore, but, but that they're pastors. My, my thinking is that these are literal angels that the Lord has assigned to these seven churches. Now, isn't that something to think about, that each church has an angel that's responsible for it? And then it says here that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So again, he's reiterating these different churches um, that are in the Revelation, the seven churches. We'll come back to those. Notice this verse in Isaiah. It says, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. So think back to this. This is John we're talking about that had spent seven, or excuse me, had spent three years, so many sevens. We had spent so many, three years with Jesus Christ himself. He had walked with him. We, we have established that at the beginning of all of this, that all, John had been through a ministry with Jesus. And when he saw Jesus in his glorified state, now I still believe that he's got the, the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and in his side, but he still, he was glorified in this. He did not see Jesus like this the first time. The, the closest he came was at the Mount of Transfiguration. And even then they fell 
the Bible says that they fell uh, because they were in the presence of God and realized the power and the majesty that was there. And this is what Isaiah was saying too. And you see all these different scriptures here that I've listed for you, and there are more, but the, these are scriptures in which uh, people had contact with a, an unusual, powerful manifestation of God himself, or they actually saw the Lord in, in some way. And every single time they fell, they fell even so much so that in John 18, when, when the people were coming to take Jesus captive, they said they, they were looking for him and he said, I am he. And when he said, I am, that brings us back to, uh, to the Old Testament. I am who I am the, the, in Exodus that God had described to Moses, who's sending you, I am sending you. And so this I am, when it, it left Jesus's lips, they fell backward under a complete state of authority and power of God himself. Now, in Pentecostal circles, there is something called uh, being slain in the spirit where people fall under the, uh, under the impression of the Lord or, or the presence of the Lord. Now, whether this is a case like that or not, I'll leave that for other people to debate. But I will say this, any time that we see people in the presence of God where this, where this much of God is allowed for them to see, they fall. And we saw that, that Daniel fell so completely that even when he got up, he was shaken. So if you've ever been in a car accident or if you've ever been in a traumatic experience, you know, after the fact, physically you shake. And that's what Daniel was doing. And the angel had to strengthen Daniel, the Bible says. And the, and the Bible says here that Jesus himself with his right hand steadied John. And so we, we see what happens under the great and mighty presence of the Lord. Who can stand before him? The Bible tells us. One of the things um, I remember back when Mercy Me released their uh, I Can Only Imagine is that, uh, which is a song that I love, but I, I've always been amused at, at this. I wonder what I would do in his presence. I don't. I think I would be on the floor like anybody else. If John and Daniel fell at the side of the Lord, how are we not going to do so? What an amazing, amazing God we serve. Notice here again, there's this emphasis in these verses of the churches, and I've listed them here uh, purposely as we're going to go through them the next two weeks. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and we're going to keep saying them over and over so we can all memorize these, these, these different churches. And you'll see here that the church has been established and Jesus is standing among the lampstands. He's standing among these stars, these angels of the church. And we'll see this verse all the way back in math or these verses back in Matthew that, that Jesus said and talking to Peter, but talking of the church. And I also say to you that that you are Peter, and on this rock, on the church, I will build uh, on himself, I'm, excuse me, on himself, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. You've already, you just saw that he has the key to Hades, and so, and, and it says this again, I now also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, on Jesus, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And so Jesus spoke here in the revelation of the commission of the church. What was? And then what is the seven churches of that day and the ecumenical church, the church that will always be uh, until the culmination of time when we go into eternity, this, this, what was, what is, and then what will, and what will be the future judgment in Revelation 20. And so when Jesus talks of himself from an eternal perspective, 
he's also looking at the state of the church at the end in Revelation 20, then there will be no more church per se. Will all, all people in Christ will just be in Christ for eternity. And we'll see this in Revelation 21 and 22. But at the final judgment, there will be this separation. And so uh, again, Jesus who was who was and is and will be he is eternal he's talking about the church and in this description of the church and this is where it will lead us to next week he is saying i see you church now what a concept we are all as christians part of the christian church and the lord from the worst church to the, that the Lord's that that the Lord described in Revelation to the best church in the Revelation, to the ones who were rich, to the ones that were poor, the ones that were suffering, the ones that were uh, were prospering. The Jesus said to all of them, "I see who you are. I see who you really are." And the eternal one today, as we look at. Revelation chapter one, we need to understand that the Lord looks at our lives, he looks at our churches, and he has expectations for us, and he gives us great hope and great peace, as he said in the beginning of this particular chapter. There's grace and peace. There's hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope in the eternal Godhead. There's hope in the Holy Spirit's power and presence for us today. So that's our, our lesson for this week. I pray that as we go forward, um, that you'll review some of the sources that I give you. Uh, last week, uh, I forgot to give you this, I believe, but if you would like the notes, uh, mlangner at cpcfamily.org or markallenlangner at yahoo.com. Uh, feel free to email me at either one of those addresses. Several of you already have. I'll be putting those notes out on Monday. It'll be in a PDF form, so it'll be easy uh, to send to you. Uh, again, here are some references that I use. This is certainly not all of them, but these are the ones from this week. Uh, as I go forward each week, I'll give you the references that were my primary sources for the week and uh, you feel free to, uh, to check out any of those. Uh, just because I give you a source doesn't mean that I'm endorsing it, of course, uh, but it does mean that uh, it, is a, uh, it is a source um, uh, for you to, to look at if you would like to. Uh, again, if you have any questions this week, please feel free to email me your questions. I'll be happy to address those uh, in the next session, and uh, anything I can do for you, please let me know. God bless you and we'll see you.